I will try to just give you some overview, shifting gears a little bit towards neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. There is a rising incidence of neuroendocrine tumors, uh, no matter which organ site uh, that a neuroendocrine tumor arises from. This is a study published from the MD Anderson group looking at the SEER database of about 64,000 patients, and they found that for most organ sites for neuroendocrine tumors, there's a rising incidence. And the purpose of this talk is going to be on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and you can see that trend holds true for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the uh, rising incidence is becoming steeper more recently. And the reason for this is more of our patients are getting uh, cross-sectional imaging, there's more incidental findings of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the rise in the incidence is actually due to more early stage tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors arise from the endocrine cells of the pancreas as opposed to the exocrine cells, which we've heard a little, uh, quite a bit about today. Uh, it accounts for five cases per one million individuals, and overall, they only account for 3% of all pancreatic tumors. The median age of diagnosis is 60 years, um, and the course for these types of tumors is more indolent than their adenocarcinoma counterpart, with a 10-year survival of about 40%. Uh, we are learning a lot more about the biology of these neuroendocrine tumors. Um, with the advances in uh, science and genomics. And uh, most recently, there was a uh, study published out of Nature last year uh, where they identified four genetic pathways that are altered in sporadic cases of neuroendocrine tumors. They involve DNA damaging, repair, chromatin remodeling, telomere maintenance, and the mTOR signaling. And the reason I throw the mTOR signaling in there is because there are targeted drugs, uh, biologic drugs, that are targeting that pathway. And I think in the coming years, we'll probably hear a little bit more about that. And about 17% of the cases have germline mutations associated with them um, with four hereditary syndromes. Uh, Theroux talked about this uh, in the first, one of the earlier sessions, but MEN1, von Hippel-Lindau, uh, uh, neurofibromatosis, and uh, tuberous sclerosis. There are three main pathology classifications. Dr. Robert can probably speak better than I can about this. Uh, with the World Health Organization, the ENETS, and the AJCC uh, guidelines. And, um, the point I just want to bring out here is that the World Health Organization uh, focuses on the grade of the tumor. In 90 percent of patients that present with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors present with a low or intermediate grade. And that intermediate grade is, the, I think, what we'll learn more about in the coming years because that is the uh, tumor grade that's a little bit unpredictable as to how these tumors are going to behave five or ten years down the road. From a, a functional standpoint, it all comes down to what's the practical implications and what, how do we best treat the patient. And this is basically how a surgical oncologist uh, will look at neuroendocrine tumors. Are they non-functioning or functioning? About 40 percent of uh, tumors are non-functioning. What, what does that mean? It means that there are no clinical symptoms associated with the neuroendocrine tumor, even though they can't produce hormones. Uh, unfortunately, since many tumors are non-functioning, 60 to 80 percent of patients present with distant metastases. Uh, and then there are functioning tumors, and functioning tumors mean that there's a dominant hormone hypersecretion that leads to clinical symptoms. Uh, there are several types, the most common being insulinoma, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, so this is very important. So how do we work up and treat someone with a non-functioning neuroendocrine tumor? And this is, I would argue, this is probably the most important slide for the management of neuroendocrine tumors, because the, resu the reason a patient can have a good outcome has to do with good upfront workup before the patient is taken to the operating room. And that is, the, that is what leads to good surgical outcomes down the road. Uh, so a patient with a uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor or suspicion for that should have a pancreas protocol CT. And these are classically hypervascular lesions. They should have an endoscopic, uh, an EUS guided FNA by the gastroenterologist, uh, which will provide a tissue diagnosis and confirm that we're dealing with a neuroendocrine tumor. Somatostatin or octreotide scans can be used in select cases. They shouldn't be used routinely. MRIs can play a role because MRIs are excellent at, uh, and very sensitive for detecting liver metastases. So if we have someone who's suspected of a liver metastases, an MRI with a liver protocol uh, is very useful. Serum biomarkers. You know, I'd love to tell you that there's a lot of great data on this, but there, you know, we need to make more improvements on the use of serum biomarkers, and I think you might be seeing more about that in the next five years or so. But right now, what we use the best is probably serum chromogranin level. Uh, so every one of my patients gets a serum chromogranin level with the diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor, and we can't consider getting urinary 5-HIAA and pancreatic polypeptides. The fundamental principles of surgery. So these are the goals that we try to achieve when we 
take someone to surgery or a pancreatectomy for a neuroendocrine tumor. One for these non-functioning tumors is to maximize local control, to increase uh, one's quality of life, and to prolong their survival ideally. And in the operating room, like you've seen with Dr. Cha's data and uh, with Dr. Salem's slides, it's important to have a good surgical outcome and a lot involved with getting an R0 resection or negative margin. So the cancer principles can't be compromised. But at the same time, uh, when I will tell you, this will make a little bit more sense in the next slide, is we want to minimize the short-term and long-term morbidity. So that surg immediate surgical complications and long-term surgical complications related to pancreatectomies such as insulin dependence and GI dysfunction. So here are some common scenarios that uh, we see for patients with non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors. So a patient presents with localized non-metastatic tumor, and as a general rule, if it can be resected completely, it should be resected. And this is associated with a median survival of 7.1 years. But an important thing to talk about to the patient before the operating room is that 50% of patients are recurrent free at two and a half, at almost three years out. So many of these patients will recur. Second is a uh, scenario of an incidental uh, tumor of less than two centimeters, and this is an evolving area. Uh, Dr. Salem uh, published a study several years ago looking at the SEER database of small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and, um, and there's been more studies, and there's been an explosion of these kinds of studies in the last several years. And the pendulum is swinging more towards observation, but at the end of the day, we still don't know the malignant potential of, of uh, some of these small neuroendocrine tumors, and that's where I think genomics, in addition to um, uh, uh, multidisciplinary management is going to help define who uh, has a malignant small neuroendocrine tumor and who does not. Um, but if an observation is chosen, these patients have to be surveyed, and if there's a change in the surveil on the imaging, they need a resection as a general rule. Then there's patients with locally advanced non-metastatic and unresectable tumors. So the reason I put, put this uh, scenario up here is I want to note that the low median survival for this group of patients is five years. So this is in contradistinction to adenocarcinoma, where the survival, unfortunately, is uh, not as long. So uh, now we're talking about an individual with years of survival, and oftentimes they can have complications related to the tumor, such as biliary obstruction, gastric outlet obstruction, or GI bleeding. And because of those reasons, sometimes we will consider palliative interventions or palliative surgical interventions for these patients. And patients sometimes will present with limited liver metastases, and these are always complicated decisions that have to be made by a multidisciplinary uh, tumor conference or, or at a Yale pancreas conference, and uh, we will sometimes consider a staged or a synchronous approach to addressing these cases. These are the operations that are used for uh, non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors. Oftentimes, they're pancreatic or duodenectomies or distal pancreatectomies. Sometimes, enucleations can be considered for small tumors, but these tumors metastasized to lymph nodes. So lymphadenectomy is an important part of that operation, particularly if an enucleation is considered uh, as the operative intervention. And I mentioned on the last slide a little bit about palliative operations, bile duct bypasses, and gastric bypasses. And this is an example of a patient we took care of um, a few years ago, 72-year-old female presented with a 3.3 centimeter incidental pancreatic mass. Um, her gastroenterologist provided and uh, performed an EUS guided FNA revealing a neuroendocrine tumor, a low-grade uh, low neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, there was no metastasis at workup, and we took her for a uh, laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about one functioning neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, but these are the principles that we think about for functioning pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors altogether. So it's important, again, the a successful outcome depends on a very good clinic visit prior to the operation, so a patient has to be carefully asked about symptoms uh, related to functioning neuroendocrine tumors. If they have symptoms suggestive of functioning neuroendocrine tumor, a biochemical workup should be performed. Um, I'll mention a little bit more about the insulinoma workup in, in the next slide, but gastrinoma, glucagon, VIP, somatostatinoma, and the chromogranonase generally got uh, is, uh, serum levels are acquired for all of these patients. And the other important point that I want to bring up for these functional tumors is uh, the biochemical workup should precede the localization workup. There's, all, there's a tendency to try to mix the two together, but first the biochemical workup needs to be made, and after you have a biochemical workup of a particular type of functioning neuroendocrine tumor, then one can proceed with a localization study. They should be separated as far as the workup goes. And the goals for surgery for functioning neuroendocrine tumors are, number one, to alleviate clinical symptoms, and that often involves removing the primary tumor and sometimes the lymph nodes, depending on if it's a malignant tumor or not, and ideally to prolong survival for malignant cases. 
Um, as far as insulinoma, insulinoma and this is the uh, one type of tumor I'll, I'll talk about, is uh, this, is the mo this is the most common functioning pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. It can occur sporadically or part of the MEN1 syndrome. These are, even, these are tumors that are evenly distributed throughout the entire pancreas, and they're rarely malignant. Uh, their clinical presentation, the Whipple's triad, uh, which a lot is written about, and this is actually a pretty accurate presentation, often hypoglycemic symptoms, uh, glucose level of less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, and symptom relief with glucose. Um, a biochemical workup needs to be performed, and traditionally this is a 72-hour fast, uh, where every uh, six to eight hours a serum glucose, C-peptide, proinsulin, insulin, and sulfonylureas are checked um, and confirming the diagnosis, and most of the time that's achieved within the first 24 hours. After a biochemical workup is achieved, then one performs uh, localization studies. And CTs are so e are excellent these days, but a patient, and, and CT, between CTs and EUSs, oftentimes the localization studies are successful. But in cases where they're not, uh, selective arteriography with calcium stimulation and hepatic venous sampling can be performed. Um, the types of operations, um, enucleation, if it can be done, these tend to be benign tumors, generally speaking, so um, if they're away from the bile, uh, away, away from the pancreatic duct, a little bit how Dr. Cha mentioned on his last talk, um, we would try to enucleate them, but, um, you know, sometimes a distal pancreatectomy or a pancreatic or duodenectomy is needed. And the other important thing is no blind resections. And this is a patient we took care of about a year and a half ago. This is an 80-year-old man who presented with hypoglycemic episodes. He had a biochemical workup um, by his endocrinologist, which revealed an insulinoma. We had a localization, we had performed localization studies after the biochemical diagnosis, uh, which revealed a pancreatic head mass. And in his case, he also had periportal and aortocaval uh, lymph nodes involved on imaging. So we took him to the operating room and we performed a, a Whipple with an extended lymphadenectomy to clear out all that lymph node disease for what was a malignant insulinoma, uh, uncommon compared to most insulinomas which are benign. Um, but the next day after the operation, he was completely symptom free from his hypoglycemia and a year and a half out now, he remains symptom free and disease free. So uh, the last part of the talk is gonna be on survival and surveillance. And this is, I touched on in the beginning of the, the, beginning of the talk. So this is that same study from the MD Anderson group where they looked at 64,000 patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And you see that, generally speaking, uh, neuroendocrine tumors uh, do better than their adenocarcinoma counterparts. Um, but the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors don't do as well as the other ones. But one, you know, if you compare pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors to adenocarcinomas, the survival is better. And what you can see is that, um, is that at, uh, in the dark green over there, you see that there, those are low-grade tumors that have a survival of over 10 years, um, and uh, intermediate-grade tumors have survivals of over five years. So those are important points to bring home that this, this is more of a uh, longer-term survival disease process as opposed to adenocarcinoma, and that's important for our decision-making for what to do. Surveillance after resection, so this is an important thing to discuss with patients, but uh, up to half of the patients will recur. Um, there's data to support that lymph node ratio and the key 67 index can predict recurrence. Um, and if recurrences happen, they almost always happen within 10 years. Despite the fact that many patients will recur, we still don't have strong evidence-based consensus guidelines. Um, and that's coming from multiple different societies. But how we generally do it is we use one of the, one of the consensus guidelines and how we do tend to do things in our uh, Yale group is we get a history and physical every six to 12 months. That's obviously very important. Biochemical markers, chromo serum chromogranin levels is something I get on all of my patients. Um, and cross-sectional imaging can be considered selectively. But the one thing I want to mention is routine octreotide scans should not be considered part of the surveillance. So in summary, uh, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the incidence is rising. The survival is generally longer than adenocarcinoma. The surgical management is largely dictated by the functional status of the tumor. For functional workups, it's important to separate the biochemical workup from the localization workup. And at the end of the day, for, for patients that undergo a surgical resection, we try to, for non-functioning tumors, we try to prolong uh, progression-free survival. And for functioning tumors, uh, we try to alleviate the hormone-driven clinical symptoms. Thank you.